well everybody uh, welcome to the second uh, weekend of uh, j krishna murthy and the contemporary world crisis conference and the fourth day of the conference so, so far we have had one uh, uh, keynote panel and one practitioner's panel and one scholar's panel uh, so today is the second scholar's panel and uh, vikas and neha have both volunteered me uh, to go first so that's why i'm going first i i i wanted to go last but i wanted to give them a say in deciding uh, when do i go so it seems that i am going first which i am very happy to do so <clears throat> each of us will have about uh, 20 to 30 minutes uh, uh, of time uh, to share our thoughts and then as usual we will open it up for uh, uh, question answers and discussion later on so i think i'll just get started so Uh, in in this paper i would like to discuss with you my personal and academic journey with krishna murthy and i will speak uh, mostly autobiographically uh, since i met my supervisor uh, my phd supervisor at ubc dr william f finer who has contributed a lot to uh, emphasize the significance of autobiographical understanding in education and living i i really love this idea of exploring things autobiographically so i thought this conference uh, was a very good place for me to explore my existential relationship with krishna murthy and my academic relationship with krishna murthy so i would like to start with explaining to you with uh, when i came upon krishna murthy and with what mindset i came upon krishna murthy and uh, and i came upon krishna murthy and the discipline of education at the same time so uh when i joined bd program i think it was in 2004 uh at that time i did not want to be a teacher at that time i had finished uh, three degrees in geography ma- uh, bachelor's of arts and masters of arts and masters of philosophy in geography and really wanted to be a professor of geography but could not uh, pass national educational testing exam so Uh, uh accidentally or forcibly ended up being in a school uh, t- uh apj school pitampura teaching for a year and then because i wasn't able to pass my uh, net exam uh, i was kind of forced uh, reluctantly coaxed persuaded to do a bachelor of education but when i came to the bachelor of education program and the kinds of questions that were being asked there existential moral questions uh, uh, the, the questions related to the the society and what do we need to change the society and all that i thought wow i i have come to my home so you know uh, we have heard uh, many other people uh, speak of uh, when they met krishna murthy it seems that many people were going through an existential crisis uh, and and, uh, and and conflicts an inward uh, uh, inward kind of a journey which brought them to krishna murti for me it was true to some extent uh, because i think by the time i reached krishna murti i felt that i was already i had already recognized the significance of awareness or sig- and the significance of self understanding and Uh, and the ability to critique the orthodoxies and and superficialities in society so my first introduction uh, to this kind of the, these kinds of ideas actually happened when i was in high school and i am not unique a lot of people uh, come across and appreciate and revel the work of uh, medieval uh, poet and mystic kabir so those of you who have uh, who are not aware of kabir i highly recommend that you uh, that you search some of his poetry his english trans- uh, translation is available as well so reading kabir at that time uh, uh, ha- had a very deep impact on me so i uh, at the same time uh, freed myself from uh, the the rituals and the uh, and the superficialities and uh, and uh, like blind faith but at the same time i began i be, i became interested in understanding the real meaning of spirituality or real meaning of uh, uh what is the, the real meaning and purpose of life and uh, uh, actually there is a study uh, by ravi and shri devi mehta they wrote a book it's called jay krishna murti and sant kabir uh, in in that study they have uh, brought together these two unique uh, figures in human history in indian history and and showed how their work connects with each other 
I'll, I'll read one uh, uh, quotation from Kabir to you. So those of you who are familiar with Krishnamurti or have been coming to the conference and getting introduced to the work of Krishnamurti, you will see how closely connected these two uh, individuals are. So here is a translation of one of, of, one of Kabir's uh, Doha's uh, couplets uh, by Rabindranath Tagore, another key uh, uh, poet and literary figure from India. So Kabir says, I don't know what manner of God is mine. The Mullah cries aloud to him, and why? Is your Lord deaf? The subtle anklets that ring on the feet of an insect when it moves are heard of him. Tell your beads, paint your forehead with mark of your God, and wear matted locks long and showy. But a deadly weapon is in your heart, and how shall you have God? You will see how uh, radical and critical Kabir is, and that was 15th century, that, that where, where the Mughal empire was at its peak, I would say, and he, how, he, how critical he was, and uh, of both Hindu religion uh, and the orthodoxy in Muslim religion, both the religions. And when you see Krishnamurti speak, it seems that Kabir is, uh, is coming alive. So in addition to the Kabir, two other things uh, happened uh, when I uh, started my university education at Kirodimal College uh, in the Geography Honors Program. At that time, I was introduced to the literature of Osho uh, by one of my friends, Anurag Balyan. He introduced to quite a few of us uh, of that literature. And I started uh, reading that literature. And at the very same, at the same time, I also met a, a professor uh, in in Kurodimal College. His his name is K K Mujumdar. Well, he's no more. Uh, he passed away. So uh, with Osho and with uh, both Majumdar sir, I Osho uh, not in person, but uh, through the literature and with Majumdar sir in person for ten years. So before I. Uh, kind of came to be it. I have already been exploring uh, the the problems of the society, the the, the global problems, and uh, also um, the significance of self understanding. Those things were already on my radar, and I was very critical of the programs that I was part of. Education I was part of because of a lot of teacher centeredness and textbook centeredness. And I was uh, uh, beginning to realize that it is very important for me, the moral questions, existential questions, uh, philosophical questions, they were very important to me. And that's why I was interested in geography of peace, uh, geographical thought, which is history of geographical philosophy. So when I came to the B.A. program and Krishnamurti and to Krishnamurti, uh, you could say that I already was kind of on the path of learning about the world and about myself. So I wasn't, I wouldn't say that I was, I didn't have any problems or conflict uh, or occasional crisis. Of course, I, I faced financial issues. I come from a uh, not a very well-to-do family. I experienced relationship issues uh, and I was constantly um, critiquing the problem of education. Uh, but at the same time, I didn't feel that I was going through uh, any kind of a crisis. I thought that I was uh, very interested in learning, growing, maturing, and uh, and that uh, that it's the search for truth that was um, or that was very important for me. Then uh, alleviating my suffering because maybe I didn't feel that I was suffering at that time, although I experienced a crippling crisis. Uh, when I finished my PhD and started working at the Mount St. Vincent University, about which I will speak later. So uh, Osho and, uh, and uh, KK Majumdar, and then two of my friends, Arurag Balyan and Rajiv Panjoria, I had a lot of, lot of discussion with them day in and day out. And later on with other people uh, like Mansi Thaplial and, and, and other people, I had a lot of discussion. So I came with that kind of a mindset uh, to the program of education. So uh, as I told you a little bit about Osho, right? Osho was a very controversial figure. A lot of Krishnamurti people don't uh, appreciate Osho much. And I think even uh, the pe people say off the record, Krishnamurti never criticizes anybody uh, by name, but off the record, people say that Krishnamurti uh, didn't uh, approve of Osho or didn't like Osho. I have some of my own criticisms of Osho, but I have uh, read about 50 books by him and I have explored whatever he's saying very deeply existentially. And I can say while certain 
uh, awkward things have happened through him around him uh, i i haven't uh, come across many people whose breadth and depth of knowledge is so vast uh, i still at times listen to some of his hindi discourses and i was describing it to my uh, wife that uh, it seems like he's singing indian classical music in prose that's the the extent of his breadth and depth uh, and uh, and the knowledge of literature is so but when i read krishna murthy uh, i i i thought wow he is raising the similar questions that have been exposed to in in osho's work and have been experimenting with meditations and existential awareness but there were certain things which i really find very unique in krishna murthy's work uh, one was his directness so krishna murthy doesn't uh, uses a lot of metaphors or examples or stories his his uh, entire focus is very direct and he communicates whatever he is saying directly uh, without any kind of fillers or filters and what i really find uh, found unique about his work was also his concern for uh, the global disorder so krishnam for krishnamurti spirituality is not uh, for the liberation of yourself for the alleviation of your own suffering it's always rooted in the compassion for the transformation of the world and uh, also what uh, really struck um, uh, me in his work was his emphasis on dialogue uh, e- e- until even until now his dialogues with david bohm continues to be uh, my most favorite literature whatever literature i have come across uh, uh, th- those are the books that he had with david uh, that uh, that are based on his dialogues with david bohm i would say those have really uh, uh, created a deep impact on me and those of who you know me and my style of uh, teaching and my style of engaging uh, which is very dialogical and dialogue based i would say i can definitely attribute to that to the oral culture in india and dialogue dialogical conversational culture in india but also to uh, these two individuals the other thing that i really uh, struck me in krishna murthy is that uh, he emphasizes on the significance of awareness uh but as a direct inquiry so he doesn't invoke any uh formulaic systems that you need to follow although some people say that krishna murthy doesn't talk about methods i really don't agree with uh, with them so krishna murthy doesn't talk about methods in in terms of uh practicing a ritual again and again and again but he does give you hint in terms of how you can explore existential awareness so those of you who want to Uh, in search of some kind of a method to begin with if you read krishna murthy closely although he is criticizing all methods methodologies he will give you a hint on what to do for example his enormous emphasis on learning the art of listening and learning the art of observation are the pathways which one can use in order to uh, understand what he means by self inquiry and existential awareness and one thing that also Uh, uh uh makes krishna murthy a uh, unique is that he thought that education could be a way of transforming the individual and the society so i uh, i would say uh, all these things made krishna murthy very unique and uh, made the program of education my career i thought this is the this is the re- really the field in which i would like to uh, work and and continue working so when i reached the bed program as i said that i was already asking questions about what's a good society what it means to live properly what's what's a good uh, what's a good life so those questions found resonance in uh, education classrooms and uh, i would say particularly some individuals were notable like jashri mathur uh, and uh, professor jashri mathur and professor sham menon professor krishn kumar i really found the, in their classes i was able to have the discussion that i was having outside of the academia but were re- was really hankering for that and uh, with reference to k while k was part of the syllabus but i wouldn't say that he was given Uh, any central or prime importance uh, most indian educators think uh, it based on my understanding and my uh, communication with them is that krishna murthy is a rich people's educator that he has no concern for social change or for the social problems 
and i feel that that is such a misguided uh, view or understanding of krishna murti because you read any of his book he, the, every book starts with his compassionate understanding of what's going on in the world the difficulty the world is experiencing the oppression the poverty the the, the climate crisis he has been talking about all that for a very long time to to, to say that his work has no relevance uh uh seemed or very little relevant seemed very uh, very out of place for you in fact i wanted to do a, a master's thesis on krishna murti but i was advised against it like minakshi was saying in her talk i was also advised against it in both my masters and in my phd but i stuck and did whatever i wanted to do in a way so i was told that work on henry juru or critical pedagogy now i loved critical pedagogy and henry juru but i, I like i was uh, surprised that why can people say that krishna murti is a critical pedagogue what is a critical pedagogue who who shows to you the problem of the society the the the, the discrimination the disparities in the society krishna murti is exactly exactly doing that and i would say at a much deeper level than critical pedagogy because he is locating that uh, Uh, the problems that we experience in the structure and the society in our very consciousness so i would say he is a quintessential a really uh, a significant uh, uh, critical pedagogue and related to that i want to emphasize you know what has happened in india and many other developing countries so called developing countries of the world and other cultures after colonialism after colonization and after the spread of european way of thinking and eurocentric uh, views of knowledge uh, it seems that we only appreciate and i have definitely experienced that in india when i was there and when i go back there uh, there is a, like a tremendous receptivity to what the white uh, people are saying now i'm not saying that the european people have not contributed tremendously to the knowledge uh, in the world but it seems that we are so enabled by that that we just want to do what's happening in the west rather than actually discovering our own uh, understanding again not uh, i'm not trying to be a right wing conservative is saying that uh, uncritically uh, accept or incorporate all of your traditions or 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 what happened in your culture but to blindly uh except whatever is happening in the west or whatever advancement is happening in the west i think that is also very problematic so i stuck with my gut and i did a thesis on social studies education under professor sham menon where in the theoretical part of it i tried to brought together critical pedagogy and krishna murti together and i uh, i i uh, proposed a way of looking at social studies education and citizenship education where you can uh, bring together the, the desire to transform the society the the goal the purposes of transforming society but at the same time uh, not forgetting that unless the inner transformation is happening the social transformation won't be lasting it won't be deep it will be very superficial so uh, after i finished my uh, master's thesis i ended up uh, the, uh, i decided to do a phd and i came to the university of british columbia and uh, i i came with a lot of passion again i wanted to do the same work i wanted to focus on social studies education and uh, explore this idea of bringing inner awareness and social transformation together what i realized so when i came to ubc and i started taking courses you have to do the course work and all that right i realize now when i look back i realize that the literature of the courses uh, was very critical and very progressive but at the same time primarily eurocentric and uh, it emphasizes a lot on the critical aspect of education which is very important but the other aspect like psychoanalysis or phenomenology or existentialism they were kind of at the margins and i was drawn primarily by those perspectives so work of people like uh, dwayne hubner uh, james mcdonald ted aoki maxim green william piner i was drawn to their work because they had some connection and interest in understanding human consciousness uh, it is uh, slightly i would say it is different from krishna murti but at least there is some connection that i could uh, 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 that i could draw upon uh so i i i was doing a, a thesis uh, at that time 
it, it I, I would say it wasn't working out because it, I felt that people are perhaps not fully understanding or I maybe I wasn't communicating well that the, the intellect and the thought that we are emphasizing that we are giving too much emphasis may be the problem itself. So should we also look at the problem uh, rooted in the thought itself? Uh, uh, I it, at, at, in the early early period of my time at UBC, I used to be very engaged in the first year, and then I I felt that I, I started withdrawing a little bit. But then a, a remarkable uh, event happened, and that was very good. So one of our professors, Anne Fallon, uh, in our doctoral seminar part two, asked everybody to propose a text that they wanted everybody to read, and then have a discussion on it. And at that time, I was very, uh, again, interested in Krishnamurti. So I chose uh, uh, the future of humanity, dialogues between David Bohm and Krishnamurti. I uh, asked my classmates and the professor to read those dialogues and then had a discussion on, on that in the class. That discussion uh, went really well in the sense that it created a deep impact, as I could sense, on the participants. Not that they were not critical of Krishnamurti or they were just uncritically saying oh, how that great is. But the questions that Krishnamurti and Bohm raised together, they created a lasting impact. And that gave me an understanding that this is really important work that I need to bring forward. And my uh, supervisor, William Pinar, th thought that that was really good. And I met somebody called Ke uh, uh, Professor Karen Meyer, who has retired now, but who was really interested in Krishnamurti uh, beforehand. So that was a good, uh, a good combination. I worked with them and developed this idea called curriculum as meditative inquiry, which remained a lot, which, which got a lot of uh, uh, currency from other people and uh, from my committee, uh, from broader audience when it was published as a book, but also uh, uh, by my students as I had been practicing those ideas in my class. So in addition to the intellectual work that I was doing in Krishnamurti, I would like to emphasize that it was never only academic and intellectual. It was always primarily inner and that I was using or I was finding my uh, academic and intellectual journey just carrying on that message. So when you are transformed within or when you have like an inner inkling, inner awakening, it affects everything that you do. And UBC campus really worked really well for me to experiment with Krishnamurti's ideas. I uh, traveled from Delhi to Vancouver and you know, Delhi is like, had, by the time I left, it was so populated, so crowded, so polluted. And UBC campus provided like a, a, a really breath of fresh air, tall trees, beautiful sky, ocean, mountains. And, and when Krishnamurti talks about, look at the nature, look at the flowers, look at, listen to the world. So the UBC campus actually uh, uh, provided me the ground where I was existentially experimenting with Krishnamurti's ideas and they had a lot of impact on me. Uh, I came across uh, uh, Gurdjieff's work here as well. I, I read, a read In Search of the Miraculous uh, uh, by P.D. Ospensky and it continues to be one of the most significant books I have read. If you haven't read it, I would highly recommend and you will see how closely Gurdjieff's work uh, at its core was uh, uh, connected to Krishnamurti. Uh, by the time I was uh, finishing my Krishnamurti, in the last year, I met with Ashutosh Kalsi, who you heard on the second day of the conference. Uh, I went to listen to one of his lectures in Vancouver, and then I went to see him in person. And when I went to see him in person, so by the time I was experimenting with meditation, and, 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 and just working on uh, my PhD, and I was getting a lot of appreciation, so by the time I met Ashutosh, I had kind of developed a, a sense of security within myself. And probably that's what I have been seeking uh, all my life as I think most of us are seeking. But when I met Ashutosh for the first time, I would say I experienced something very different. Uh, it's like a sense of Im immeasurable silence, uh, a, a, a sense of, okay, the, the, there is something else other than all this as well. Um, and then uh, I continued my uh, discussion with Ashutosh. I, 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 we have been discussing for about uh, more than a decade now, and it never feels stale or repetitive or mechanical or, uh, or, 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 uh, 
or or something that is that has no existential quality always talking with him as i think you all must have experienced there, there is a real uh, a quality of depth uh, in from which he speaks because i think he is a very authentic he doesn't repeat krishna murti he has been touched by krishna murti but that has allowed his i think his own inner awakening his own inner transformation so he's not bookish and with him uh, i i i learned what it means to uh, to listen to somebody with your whole being so that that person can be heard by the time i finished my uh, phd you know i had finished my phd from ubc i uh, uh, landed up a job at mount st vincent university and when i came there i uh, came here in 2011 i begin to feel that uh, the uh, i begin to uh, feel that a, uh, a crippling crisis was creeping in uh, i would sing all the time i still do i have been learning music but I, at that time i wasn't learning so i'm sure i was torturing people but i i i i, I really love singing so i would sing all the time but i i had no desire to uh, publish to write and i withdrew from many interaction and i would feel that there is a sense of uh, heavy uh, uh, inactivity that was kind of descending upon me that i didn't want to do too much i didn't want to uh, kind of act i just wanted to remain inactive and uh, i i did work at the uh, at the surface level uh, whatever was required of me but uh, i stayed with that sense of inactivity and it, that that it was very difficult to stay because you know the whole world pushes you to do your being your yourself pushes you to do to do to achieve so it it was a difficult period but because i stayed with it i stayed uh, with the questions i stayed with the, uh, the 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 crisis that i was i was experiencing and it was uncaused there was no reason i had everything that i needed so i i i can't place it on anything other than that i it was uh, perhaps you could say meaninglessness uh, a crisis of meaninglessness and i would always say to other people well i feel so much meaning in my life but still there is this sense of meaninglessness that uh, these existential questions that keep on bothering me uh so because i stayed with that question i would say in in few years uh that kind of a burden that was on my uh, heart th- those stones that were on my heart somehow they started falling and disappearing uh, on their own uh and uh and, and uh, they brought in a tremendous interest i i have always been interested in teaching but the teaching became very uh uh, uh i would say uh, something that i was really deeply interested in and uh, at this time i also dis- discovered my passion for i've always known that i love music uh, but i discovered my passion for learning music and i, I started doing that uh, krishna murti i used krishna murti in almost all of my courses directly or indirectly but in uh, in a particular course holistic education course for graduate uh, students i focus a lot on krishna murti Uh, they read their books like uh, krishna murti's book like wholeness of life uh, it's a conversation between bohm uh, krishna murti and scheinberg and then first and the last freedom education and the significance of life a wholly different way of living so i would introduce students to uh, these ideas and students will have a lot of uh, uh, so it, it, in the beginning it will go through a lot of difficult period of difficult issues that we would discuss right because case criticism of uh religion organized religion and orthodoxy and uh the, the criticism of the fear based way of our life and criticism of just a uh, constantly doing to achieve things rather than being intrinsically drawn to do things doing things for the love of learning so those things would create a lot of enriching and intense discussion but i would say most of the people really loved the way uh, i organized the classes and they loved the learning uh, from from krishna murthy's perspective where dialogue is very important uh, freedom and creativity is very important and the and education as a holistic engagement with your whole being is very important so i would say overall students have uh, uh, re- really responded uh, very well uh, to what krishna murthy has said so uh, i think i would just conclude because i'm over time i i can go on and on and on about it uh, but basically the point that i was trying to emphasize that i reached krishna murthy uh, with already a mindset 
that self inquiry is important and when i read krishna murti it had a lot of impact on me because of its directness and it just became part of my journey so there has been a time where i when i don't read krishna murti for a long time but uh, you don't need to read and repeat you need to understand and when that understanding happens uh, it operates on its own i would like to just read one paragraph and then conclude it overall engaging with and experimenting with case work and the work of other similar teachings have existentially impacted all aspects of my life personal social academic and even creative side of my work indian classical music it's a very orthodox system in some ways but i approached it from a very different perspective what happens when you begin to study yourself and the world the observation and listening removes the barriers within yourself fears conditionings anxiety conflict which allows your creative intelligence to function then you know that neither k nor any other teacher or religion can help you live and understand life you can read them appreciate them learn from them because they have tremendous insights but none of that can actually do anything for you ultimately you have to take the responsibility and live wakefully and once that happens your life changes forever you can never go back to the state of sleep let the truth touch you and then it will operate thank you i hope i didn't take too much time neha and because i wasn't looking at the watch no no i think that was a a really enlivening um journey through your personal life which i always appreciate hearing and i i particularly appreciate you um you know linking other spiritual and philosophical teachers to krishnamurti through your own personal journey um and and particularly also your point about really embodying the teachings in the way that you have appreciated in ashutosh but that i have appreciated in you um as opposed to just uh you know you know reading about thinkers and and repeating their thoughts so that so i thought that was very um very insightful so i but i i will pick up on some of the other themes that you discussed in my own presentation but so i thought i'll turn it to vikas to offer just any uh, reflections or comments on ashmi's talk before i start oh well i have had a similar uh, journey as ashwini's so i i am more or less in an, in an agreement with him so uh, right now uh, uh, i think i would uh, stay with his ideas uh, because his way of engagement uh, with krishna murti was on uh, on a one yeah, one trajectory it was and mine was another so uh, he he came directly to krishna murti and i uh, took a round about and then came uh, came to krishna murti so yeah i think i would stay here okay great thank you so maybe i will uh i'll start then so as i think we've mentioned earlier in the conference i teach at the law school and i write about law and that may be seems like a kind of unlikely place to find somebody talking about krishna murthy so i i wanted to use my time to just share how i became exposed to his ideas which was primarily through ashwini and how that exposure you know became relevant in my life and then naturally started impacting my teaching and research so when i was younger i i was like you know in my childhood and youth i was always drawn towards religion and spirituality and my primary exposure growing up was to hinduism so by the time that i had finished my undergraduate degree and my law degree i had developed a sense of of spirituality that was influenced a lot by what i think i might call like traditional hinduism but other people may have different definitions of that so part of that idea for me was that um you know being virtuous or being good corresponds to discharging one's duty um you know and, and just as an aside i think there's a lot of security that comes with that kind of morality because once you have determined what your duty is all you have to do is discharge it so it's kind of intellectually easy to have that kind of morality so i had this idea that um this kind of commitment to duty and and its discharge and so i had that idea when i came when i became a lawyer and i started practicing law so at that time at the forefront of my mind was you know figuring out what is the duty of a lawyer who represents clients in litigation because doing that will then be virtuous so 
And I developed a sense that the duty of lawyers is to you know, make sure that they represent their clients' interests through the legal procedures that are available. That's their duty. So to take the clients through the procedures to the best of their ability. And then the ultimate outcome, so like whatever the judge decides at the end of the day, is not the lawyer's concern, right? The primary concern is going through the process and then the outcome is not no longer their concern. So you can see, you know, for those who are familiar, Bhagavad Gita themes permeating that, right? So take no interest in the outcome of the actions, but take absolute interest in the discharge of the duty. So this is the kind of spiritual orientation that came with me when I started my journey in legal academia. So my central interest was about legal processes because that's what I was concerned with. So my thinking was that if we make sure that we have good, noble legal procedures and we, and we ensure that litigation lawyers understand that it's their duty to make proper use of those procedures, then that's virtuous. And that should lead to a fair, stable, peaceful, harmonious society. And so this is, this is what legal academics do. Oftentimes, you know, people say you, you research in law, what does that mean? So what legal academics do is they say, okay, what are the problems that are facing the world? So we're, this conference is at least partly about contemporary crises. So things like racism, classism, any isms, interpersonal conflicts. So whatever is in, interesting that particular person, they'll look at that problem or crisis and they'll say, okay, well, how do we change the laws or in my case, how do we tweak the legal procedures to help resolve these issues or to, you know, to make a progressively better world through the avenue of law? So this is the enterprise of legal academics. And this is the enterprise that I thought that I was playing my part in. So I was asking for me, it was, you know, when we have person to person conflicts, which lead to a legal dispute, what are the best legal procedures to use to resolve those conflicts fairly? such that harmony can then be restored among the conflicting parties. So that's where, where I was. So I started a PhD trying to explore that. And I think in the first couple of years, I was relatively satisfied with life. Like I, I had, you know, the doctorate was there. I sort of had a sense of what I was doing for the next few years. It was, there was a stability there that was okay. But as the doctorate continued, and I think everybody who's done a doctorate or many people know that as it continues, the anxiety starts to creep up, right? So that was happening to me. And, and, and eventually the anxiety just took over. And although I had this kind of supposed ethic of not being concerned with outcomes, I was in fact very concerned with outcomes, like very concerned with outcomes for several years of my life, like finishing the doctorate for one thing, um, getting a job at the end, all of that stuff. So there was a lot of tangible fear, anxiety, and even a lack of, of real passion for the work that I was doing. And that, feel, that particular feeling, that lack of passion has permeated my life tremendously throughout. But, but there, were a, there was a, a definite rising of fears and anxieties. And it's in that mindset, in that state that I met Ashwini. <laughs> so when you meet Ashwini, I think most of people who are attending will already have this sense, but at some point, you will one way or another get exposed to Krishnamurti. And, and not really because he says, hey, read Krishnamurti, but because I feel that his, his study of Krishnamurti has been so authentic and intrinsic that it's just part of who he is now. So when I met him, we started talking about the inner life. And instead of running away from anxieties or, or masking them behind a religious concept or a concept of duty or prayer or whatever, or like religious acceptance or submission, even those can mask, be used to mask anxieties. We talked about just staying with the anxieties. And, and that was very difficult. Um, like I, I remember in some of our earlier conversations, I felt like saying like, why would I not wanna run away from anxieties? Like they are terrible monsters. And when you see a monster, you need to run. Like that's very rational. <laughs> um, but I took his word for it, I think, and I tried it. and. Um, I believe that I have seen glimpses of the reality, at least, that when you stay with those inner conflicts and you try not to hide them behind religious concepts or, or any other intellectual concepts, the, the struggle that they can bring seems to dissolve or resolve. And I felt that I could see then that the inner conflicts and the uneasiness that results from them 
are not necessarily there to torture a person. They're, they're there kind of in a more compassionate way. Like they're there because they alert you that you're, there's a disconnect between you and your life happening. So I started kind of reinterpreting what the anxieties meant and what they were doing for me. It's kind of like physical pain. Like to some degree, physical pain is important because it tells you that something is wrong that you need to fix, right? Um, so, so this started, I started interpreting that more similarly then. So I was becoming increasingly interested in studying the inner life as it is. So <clears throat> I read Ashwini's book, um, Curriculum and Meditative Inquiry, or Curriculum as Meditative Inquiry, and which is largely rooted in, in some other ideas, but, but in Krishnamurti's ideas, I think there's a, a rooting there. Um, and within the first couple of pages, he poses a question that really impacted my approach to law. So he says, in the, I think it's in the, the third page or something, where he says, can social change be truly possible or even desirable if the individuals themselves do not undergo transformation? Can there be peace and order in society if the individuals themselves are in conflict and disorder? So this question for me, it, it was kind of like a lightning rod in a sense, like it, it questioned the most foundational taken for granted assumption that had been permeating my legal scholarship, which was that changes to laws and legal structures is a viable uh, way towards actual peace and a truly harmonious society. That question that he poses in the beginning of the book kind of shook that a little bit. So for instance, if we say, okay, we see a problem of racism, you know, recently that is on everybody's mind. We, or we see a, the environmental crisis in the world. Are we really going to engender a true authentic transformation of society by introducing new laws to control how people act? Or if we have, let's say we have two people in a dispute, take a simple dispute like a contract situation, someone breaches the contract. Well, in the law world, we're gonna say, okay, we're gonna argue about what your legal rights are through the legal processes and the judge is gonna decide and that's gonna resolve the conflict. But is that really resolving the conflict at any deeper sense? You know, maybe not. It's certainly making the conflict go away, but the individuals involved are unlikely, they may, but they're unlikely to be feeling any sense of actual peace inside. So when I start, so I was starting to feel the importance of the fact that making changes through laws and legal procedures doesn't quite hit at the core of our social crises. Like that's not gonna make someone less racist inside. They're going to help, the laws are gonna help because they can control somebody who behaves in a racist way. And that can be very necessary in a society, but it's not resolving that inner issue. So again, I wanna be careful that my, my point is not that law doesn't have utility. It, it does, I think it is necessary at times to alleviate oppressions and it has been used to do good. It can also be really dangerous as a societal structure. And you know, one example is what occurred in Nazi Germany was in some sense endorsed in law, like it was legally authorized. So it can be dangerous. And so I, I certainly remain committed that we should ensure that our laws are fair and that's a good usage of energy. But I felt like I realized that that laws and changing laws are is oriented towards responding at a societal level to the disorder that human beings create because of their greed, prejudice, divisiveness, ambition, commitment to accumulation, all things that I see in myself as, as I explore internally. And that type of societal response is necessary, but I have come to kind of believe and see that the peace and the stability that they ensure is actually quite superficial because it's not responding to the disorder itself that gave rise to the problems in the first place. So where does this leave me in terms of my scholarship? Did I give up on writing about law? Um, what, what it happened is I actually kind of just changed my focus a little bit. So I have become really interested now in alternative approaches to conflict resolution that at least to some extent really do centralize the inner experience of the individuals who are involved in the conflict, which the traditional legal system doesn't really prioritize. So what I'm trying to work through now is um, thinking about how we can encourage an approach to dispute resolution where people 
actually engage in dialogue and try to understand each other's perspectives of an experience of the conflict, understand their own prejudices and jealousies and fears and those of the other party in the conflict. And through that understanding, maybe they can come to a more spontaneous resolution through understanding, which doesn't depend necessarily on external authoritative laws telling them what to do. So I think that developing that type of approach is you know, maybe a necessary complement to the traditional legal system. And it's not that this, this has, there are people working on this, people talking about how to resolve disputes through mediation and restorative justice in other ways. But I think it's necessary to bring the two together to have a more holistic approach to societal be betterment through kind of an added focus on the actual individual internally, as opposed to just for focusing on the external system of law. Which I, which I think is external and the responses are necessarily necessary though superficial. So that's how my research orientation has been impacted, but my introduction to Krishnamurti through Ashwini has also impacted my teaching. So I wanted to just touch on that as well. So <clears throat> over the last couple of years, um, I have at times opened up dialogues with my students about nothing in particular, just, you know, how are you doing? What's going on with you? And what I have learned is that there is a group of our students who have this feeling that law school is resulting in some sort of disintegration for them. It's like, it's like something that's happening that's pulling them apart and causing some sort of uneasiness. And through these conversations, we have tried to figure out what is going on? What is it that we're doing that is causing this? And as far as I can tell, having thought about it a little bit, is that it, there's many reasons, I guess, but what I think it boils down to is that we're not that great at giving people space to figure out what they are intrinsically motivated by. And we're not great at prioritizing that figuring that out in higher education, not, not just the law school. I think it's <clears throat> probably relevant throughout higher education. And what we're pretty good at instead is encumbering people with all sorts of external benchmarks like grades, grading on the bell curve so that everybody is constantly compared to each other. You can only give so many A's, you can only give so many B's. And, and then we give these kind of predetermined ideals of success as well. Um, so in the law context, you know, getting a big law firm job is success, and that's what everybody should be striving towards. So all of that seeps its way into the law school culture, and these external things become really dominant and encroaching on people. So they don't feel like they have space to figure out what they actually want to do, because they're so focused on getting grades and getting big firm jobs, whether or not they truly intrinsically want to do that. So they're just getting swept up into it. And I, I think that at least some of the students who come into our care are, are very sensitive to that. So I was seeing this and I was also, you know, simultaneously relating with Ashwini and watching what he does in some of his classes and you know, the way that he prioritizes internal self-awareness for his students and tries to get them to engage in his classes from a very intrinsic place. He was mentioning this just now. So he seems to have found a way to give people space to figure out, you know, what actually am I interested in? And, and that I have to say was very meaningful to me. Like when we first started talking about his teaching and how he relates to his doctoral students and graduate students and his uh, BEd students and, and just helps them find themselves in relation to the subject, I found myself like jealous of his students because I had experienced and pursued law very extrinsically, like pursuing externally driven ideas of success and what it means to successfully complete law school. And the result was that landed me in a very traditional law job practicing civil litigation, which may be a dream job for someone else, but wasn't for me, at least not intrinsically. I probably thought so when I first got the job offer, I was probably very happy. But, but as I started working in it, it was clear that you know, it wasn't making good of my actual intrinsic strengths or interests. So it was very draining for me personally. And um, I don't think it's good for a society generally when you have people in those kinds of positions who really shouldn't be there. Um, so I started to think that 
there would be a tremendous value, both at an individual level and a societal level, to allowing students to being a little bit more free to explore their interests, to figure out what is truly natural to them, what is actually sparking their interest. So, um, and I think we're gonna be hearing a lot more insights on this when we hear from the students and teachers from the Krishnamurthy schools in the next couple of days. But I thought that I would share at least a couple of the little things that, that I have done to try to give space to my students within the constraints of, of higher education as it is now. So one thing that I have done is try to incorporate more learning through dialogue. So let's say that I'm teaching a class on the concept of conflict. So instead of you know, lecturing on the various theories of conflict, instead what I can do now is assign some background readings prior to the class and then engage with those concepts exclusively through dialogue so that now it's not just a one-way knowledge transfer, it's, a, it's an exploration together. So you know, I might facilitate by posing some initial questions or rephrasing or seeking clarifications from the students. Um, but I've, but more, for the most part, I just let the dialogue unfold. And what I have witnessed is that students really look inside themselves to understand and grapple with their own viewpoints. They raise examples of conflicts from their own lives with parents, partners, roommates, employers, whoever. They often share their own vulnerabilities. So we, be, we become very close in some of these classes. And then from those very intrinsic, meaningful experiences, then we can relate back to the theories. But we relate to the theories from a very internal place. So it seems to be that the dialog dialogic method allows for the subject matter to become really personal for the students as opposed to just like a information overload. So that's one thing, dialogues in the classes. The second thing that I, I have um, also borrowed from Ashwini is, the, is critical reflection journals. So the students in the class can are asked to write five entries on anything that has struck them or sparked their interest or moved them throughout the course. And so I see this as a chance for people to come a little bit more closely into contact with themselves in relation to the course. And it's very free. Like there's no predetermined question that everybody has to reflect on and answer. It's just whatever interests you, whatever made you go, oh, that's interesting, or oh, I didn't think that before. Whatever sparks your interest, you can write about that and write about how it has impacted you, how it has informed your sense of self as a lawyer, that sort of thing. So again, a lot of freedom. Um, and then within that project, instead of one or two of the entries, I invite students to prepare a creative work. So a piece of art, a poem, a painting, a sculpture, and to provide you know, a brief explanation of how that relates to the class. And so when I first introduced this into the law school setting, I thought, who's, I didn't know who's gonna take me up on this. Like who's gonna do a painting? I didn't know. But now after a couple of years, I have shelves full of their artistic work. And you can actually see behind me there, these two paintings were done by one of my students in last year's class. So this one is supposed to depict like the traditional <laughs> legal system of conflict resolution and this one, a more dialogic or holistic approach. So that was a really nice couple of pieces, but. I have tons of stuff now from the students. And a lot of the students have said that they really loved being able to um, just do something that they loved without any guilt or, or feeling that they were wasting time on it because it was part of a course. So I was just happy to be able to give them that space for, for their creative expression. So that has been helpful. And I, I have really enjoyed reading their reflections as well. They're often quite moving. And then the last thing that I have introduced is that the students do presentations. This year, we had them more as like online learning modules, but usually they're presentations. And again, I've tried to just prioritize freedom in the presentation. So the students can pick any topic that relates to dispute resolution. And the point is to just teach the class about that topic. And again, I, I got this idea when I was talking to Ashwini in his, I think it's his geography class, he can correct that, but I think it's geography where he lets students just choose anything that relates to geography and then um, express that. So he's done, he's gotten stuff on geography of tattoos, geography of music, geography of spirituality, everything. So I thought, well, why not try that in ADR? So, or that's alternative dispute resolution, my, my course. So, you know, I, I say to the students, like, for once in law school, this isn't about making an argument. 
It's not about a crisp, logical argument. What I want is for people to share their passion, share their interest in the, in, uh, the topic that they choose and find creative ways to engage with the, with the class. And again, when I first introduced this, I wasn't sure what was going to happen because law students are used to having structure and like, you know, one, two, three type logical um, uh, instruction for what to do, but I keep it really free. But I, again, they have surprised me. They have done presentations on pop culture and dispute resolution, indigenous traditions and dispute resolution, nonviolent communication, meaning of creativity. Um, environmental conflicts, sports arbitrations, like anything that they care about, they have brought that into the ADR world and it has um, really enlivened the class. So these are the, the few things that I've tried it within my uh, construct where I can. And in the ADR class, that's the dispute resolution class, I have more freedom. In, in other classes, I'm a little bit more bound to the curriculum, but this is like a, this is a free class, so it's fun. Um, now, no, none of this is earth shattering. You know, some of the some of the other props in the school also do dialogues and also do some of this stuff. But what I have learned is that you really do get to see students be natural and passionate when you give them space. And um, and you know that's been an important lesson for me as well. So I think I'll leave it there. Thank you for your presentation, Nea. I think that was uh, really good. Uh, you have made a lot of references to me, but you didn't tell anybody how difficult it is to have dialogue with me, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm also a little bit crazy. Um, uh, she has talked a lot about her teaching and, and um, I think she's a very accomplished teacher. She has just recently received a award, a teaching award from her faculty of, uh, uh, faculty of law. So, uh, uh, you know, Krishnamurti says one thing, somebody asked Krishnamurti, I don't know who that person was, that this, uh, uh, the, 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 the medical system that he was working in is corrupt. It's like useless. I don't want to work in it. And Krishnamurti said, but where are you going to run away? Why don't you change the system? So a lot of people think that Krishnamurti is not for changing the system. He is actually changing the system. But once you have changed, whatever you will change the system. So you can see in, in the context of uh, Neha, like she uh, realized the problem, she grappled with the problem. And once you change, once you begin to see things differently, your uh, research changes, your teaching changes. And no matter where, whichever context, your gardening will change. You, the way you deal with uh, nature tale, the, the, the way you deal with uh, children and trees, it, everything will change. If you are changing within yourself, the things are going to change. But, you know, we, we find, uh, you know, you were talking about action, like, uh, a lot of people say, karam karo, just do your action. But the action also have to be reflective. It also has to be critical, what it is leading to, where it is going. It's not a greed-based outcome, but you need to see what your action is about. So I think reflection uh, in, in Hindu uh, literature, there is a term called sakshi, or being uh, aware of your action. That is also very important. Uh, and I think one point that you raised is uh, so important. You know, a lot of us think that uh, the anxieties, the fears, uh, the conflicts, they are our enemies. Vikas, maybe we'll talk more about it. That they are our enemies. And as soon as they show their face, we just want to shut them. So they show their faces in dream. They are not going to let you be at ease. The reason is they're saying something is gone wrong. That's why we are there, like the physical pain, as Neha was saying, right? And I think Krishnamurti, I don't think anybody has spoken as directly about it or shows the alchemy of it as Krishnamurti, that if you stay with it, with your whole being, that thing will completely change. It's healing. Ashutosh was talking about that as well uh, the other day. Uh, I, I think that's it for me. Uh, the, thank you. Thank you, Neha. Vikas, do you have any thoughts on Neha's presentation? I'm afraid too many, but uh, I'll refrain from sharing them because uh, my doctoral work was on dialogue. So uh, the moment Neha talked about started talking about dialogue, I'm, I'm, I'm all having all these flashbacks where I'm, I've been trying to have dialogue with students. Some successful, like they, some do become dialogue. Some stay as a monologue or my polyphony, as uh, Bakhtin would put it. So yeah. Uh, 
I, I, I totally agree with uh, Neha's sentiment of struggling with having dialogue. And you know, if if you get across one student, the kind of excitement that it hope that you feel that you will be able to do it again, and the next time when you do it, it falls flat, mm -hmm. and 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 you don't understand how and why it happened. So um, and and sometimes you don't even think of. You know, engaging in a dialogue and then spontaneously uh, dialogue happens, mm -hmm. and then uh, you realize the importance of being again more than doing and saying. So yeah, I I, I totally get that. And, and yeah, I know I I agree. Is is there was a time when it was very difficult for me to let go of a of a structured lecture and just allow a dialogue without knowing exactly what we were going to cover. It it took some time. All right, uh, I think Vikas and Neha, let's take a quick five minute break and then we, is that okay Vikas and then you can present after that so that everybody is attentive to your Definitely. thoughts. Okay, you. see you in five minutes. Sure. Are you uh, ready to go Vikas? Sure. Okay. Hello everyone. Uh, so uh, there are uh, too many things that uh, have, have come to my mind, but I would try to restrict myself to the uh, topic that I thought I would be discussing today. Uh, on a reflective note, um, Ashwini, uh, I do not know if we should begin with our stories of engagement with Krishnamurti's ideas because uh, it is past and Krishnamurti would not give much importance to it. But again, uh, the past is how we come to be. So in a way, um, uh, past also tells us uh, who we are and, and how we have come to be. Uh, so I would uh, still go with some historical background, personal historical background. So similar to Ashwini, I was also introduced to Krishnamurti during my bachelor's of education course. Uh, but my engagement, real engagement with Krishnamurti uh, began many years later. Uh, uh, however, there were, uh, and, and I, I must say that Krishnamurti's ideas were always, uh, in a way, my, re my reference point uh, while engaging with different uh, disciplines and different topics. So after my B.Ed., I uh, bachelor my after my bachelor's in education, I, I pursued my master's in psychology, uh, which with the uh, specialization in clinical psychology, and I was studying about disorders, therapies, and I was engaging with issues of internal conflict in a very real way, and uh, and yeah, there were therapies. There 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 was a lot of discussion about. Uh, a self and, and, and the ideas like self is essentially fragmented, fragmented and you know uh, that it, it, it's, we, we, are, we, are, we are subjected to certain historical situations and that is why we, uh, we, we are subjects and not persons probably. Uh, but they didn't feel uh, right uh, and, and I did not have the vocabulary to articulate uh, and the best vocabulary that I found was of uh, uh, Carl Rogers, person-centered therapy. So th that was closest to what uh, felt like, yes, this is something worth doing, worth pursuing. Uh, and interestingly, it was after uh, reading a dialogue between Carl Rogers and Martin Buber that I got fascinated, really got fascinated with the idea of dialogue. Uh, and, and it's a very interesting dialogue, this, this uh, dialogue between Rogers and Buber, where Rogers is uh, hopeful about having a dialogue and Buber is restrictive and, you know, he's, uh, uh, he's, he's a little concerned whether we can have dialogue on a public space. And, and then they both dialogue and, and in a way it beautifully represents the boundaries or blurring of boundaries rather between psychology and philosophy. Uh, so that is when I came to the idea of dialogue. And then I uh, went to, ma uh, to pursue masters in education, but this idea of dialogue uh, preoccupied me. So uh, even while 
uh, studying philosophy of education or uh, mental health in education i i was still with uh, this idea of dialogue and uh, this phase was in a way preparation for my doctoral study and uh, which i did from uh, from the department of education university of delhi uh, and it, it was during my doctoral study that i started uh, comparing contrasting understanding uh, different ideas of dialogue so by socrates by freire bakhtin buber krishna murthy uh, and many others and uh, in in this exploration initial exploration i found that uh, there are a lot of parallels between buber and krishna murthy and uh, uh, thanks to professor minachi thapan i was able to explore uh, this interface and, uh, and 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 these parallels between them uh there was a conference in which i could float my ideas got a number of uh, reflections and comments on it and uh, then uh, i the, the paper got published as a working paper with ds kothari center at university of delhi uh so that was my beginning of an academic engagement with krishna murthy uh somehow i i i felt that uh working on krishna murti and trying to systematize krishna murti would be uh, in a way being anti krishna murti or not, so non krishna murti in, in its sense so uh, I, i didn't plan and i never this, this thought even didn't even come to my mind that i should try to formalize his ideas for me they were uh, not to be something not to be formalized at all until i read ashwini's work paper with, with uh, ds kothari center so it was very intriguing paper and and uh, i engaged with it for quite some time uh, that how a scholar is trying to and a teacher scholar and a teacher is trying to formula, formulate krishna murthy's ideas uh, but i stayed away from uh, do, doing that myself uh, as, as i was still not too convinced about it uh, and then that is how uh, i that's why i'm saying i, I came to a, through a long winding road to krishna murti because i came through the idea of dialogue uh so uh, again uh, uh, i i restricted my study to martin buber's ideas and people who have uh, thinkers who have focused on the category of dialogue uh, in their uh, uh, writings so that is how my i, I delimited my uh, study uh, however i have worked uh, later on as well and i have worked on krishna murti in different spaces so some have been provided by professor thapan some in uh, through other uh, institutions and i agree uh, uh, with dr kalsi and mr gupta in saying that most of us discover krishna murti in our moments of crisis and that an emphasis on thought is the is at the center of our crisis so uh, in a way uh, this this exploration of krishna murti as a philosophical counselor is a result of my search for holism for for wholeness for a theory to live by a way to transgress the academic disciplinary boundaries uh so i in a way academized my quest right from the beginning i remember when i i read uh, martin's uh, introduction to krishna murti on krishna murti in 2006 uh, in in that copy i made notes about how a counseling system can be built on krishna murti so interestingly i didn't want to build a uh, system of education on krishna murti but i could conceptualize a system of therapy and and the one thing that was at the core of that conceptualization was that it was uh, it it gave space to everyone to find their own normative stances it was not prescriptive in that sense and that is what i found uh, uh, in krishna murti which was even more revolutionary probably than uh, uh, than carl rogers because carl rogers still has a, a lot of uh, implicitive implicit normative stances 
which I felt that Krishna Murti liberates us from. Uh, so, the, and, and that that was the origin of uh, this idea of philosophical counseling. I did not have the word philosophical counseling by the way at that time, but yes, a counseling system or a way of or an approach to counseling to uh, through Krishna Murti uh, and his ideas. Uh, but then there are certain questions which emerge, and the first is that why should one develop a perspective of philosophical counseling based on Krishnamurti's thought at all, when he himself did not believe in any systems, perspectives, or method. So, and and as uh, Ashwini, you yourself highlighted in the in the beginning of the session, that his his idea of method is not in, in a ritualistic tool sense of a way. So, uh, and and it is. Uh, it is highlight. It is characterized by this facilitating space, in which one is free from normative ideals, and therefore one has the possibility to exist in in a sense of freedom, and to realize one's own truth. And in this idea uh, of of realizing one's own truth, with the uh, uh, with with reference to love and compassion, is. Uh, something that I find uh, uh, demarcating between Krishnamurti as a modernist and a postmodernist. So, so this this universal ethic of love and compassion uh, uh, is 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 probably the basis on which uh, we can say that he is a modern thinker rather than a postmodernist thinker, where there is a lot of relativism in uh, ethics. So in in that sense, I I don't believe that Krishna Murti's way is a way of uh, you know full or complete freedom or uh, you know uh, willfulness. It's not that. Uh, second objection uh, that could be raised uh, in in reference to a system of philosophical counseling or an approach to a philosophical counseling is that uh, it is. Basically, the counselee's quest to find his or her calling. So, isn't the role of counsellor redundant? And and the same argument can be raised for you know Krishna Murti schools that if student has to realize his or her own destiny, then what's the role of the teacher? And and here I find a lot of parallel in this idea of philosophical counselling and educating that. The teacher is is not someone who is directing you, not someone who is controlling you, is not someone who is telling you what to do and what not to do, and and uh, and and the space is a dialogical space where there is a lot of uh, uh, there is a lot of respect of uniqueness of uh, human experience, and uh, there's this. Um, strength of relationships. So, uh, uh, even Carl Jung, in that sense, says that you know, a real counseling happens not through what a counselor does or say. It happens through the way you are, through your being, and the kind of relationship that you establish with others. So, similarly, healing and educating they do not happen through these techniques. Yes, they may help to some extent, but I believe that. They, uh, it's it's the, it's the way of being of a person that really brings start transformations in uh, any any sort of trans transformation in others, and and uh, I think this is the experience uh, that you get when you listen to Krishna Murti. There is an interesting difference in reading Krishna Murti and listening to Krishna Murti that that I have felt. I don't know if others have felt the same. So if you read Krishna Murti. His ideas and his words become so seem so commonplace that you know, yeah, yeah, this we know, this we know, yes, this we know. But when you listen to Krishna Murti, it's in the in in the spaces in between words, in the silence in between words, that uh, I, I felt that there is a real transformation is taking place. It can you, you cannot pinpoint when you changed or when your ideas become. Uh, uh, become free of entanglement. But yes, those are the spaces of silence where dialogue happens with Krishna Murti. Uh, 
philosophy. So uh, similarly, in a, in, in a philosophical counseling, yes, words will be important when you talk to someone, when you express yourself. But the, the, it, it is in a way a self-subversive activity that you are using words to get rid of words. And uh, probably it is this point with, which we call as choice, choiceless awareness uh, when we really do not feel the need of words. Uh, and similar, uh, okay, so another idea which uh, uh, I find it's, it's quite liberating in Krishnamurti's thought is this shift away from a code based, a code of conduct based idea of ethics. So uh, whenever you engage with, you know, in, 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 in engage in professional spaces, there's a lot of emphasis on what one should do and one, one sh what one should not do. And probably that is why education is not considered a discipline because the role of a teacher, I, I don't think it, it is uh, possible to capture it in, in a few sentences or in, in say a number of pointers. But similar is the case of a counselor. You do not know what will, uh, what, 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 which experience will be a healing experience for the other. So it was this struggle of the self, the other, and their intersubjective relationships, which was at the center of my exploration. And uh, it, it was this sense of in between, if I use Buberian uh, terminology, that what happens between you and I, which is important. So again, there I found an ethical stance which was neither uh, uh, inclined towards subjective relativism nor going to a universal rationalism or you know, duty ethics or other kinds of ethics. So this uh, I have found very uh, uh, a very powerful but yes, very sensitive area. So if, even when you engage with students, and, and when you engage with students in different ways, uh, my, even my colleagues and uh, uh, others who know me, they question, they want to ask me and want me to explain, why do I work in this way? So, so when you want to have a dialogue, you, and you want to sit with people, you want to spend time, you, you, you discuss their personal lives sometimes when they open up and you are open to, uh, uh, to, to their expressions, all sorts of expressions. But then you, you face these questions like, isn't this a waste of time? Isn't, is it, are, you, are you really supposed to do this as a teacher? How it would help in, 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 uh, in, in the learning of the student? And it is only when we understand teaching as uh, a, a process of uh, I do not know uh, how, if I should say assisting or facilitating, all, all these words uh, defy that role uh, of, of, of a person who is there for others. And it is this feeling that other people feel. I mean, th this is what my, what my students have uh, told me, that uh, it, it is your welcoming space uh, that, uh, makes us come to you and discuss things with you. So, and, and they often say that we did not plan to discuss this or that with you, but in that space, it happens. So uh, that is a kind of relationship uh, which, uh, which is transformatory, but it, it's not easy to even try to formalize it. The way it, it's like uh, that, a song so whatever I'm, I'm i'm going whatever in whichever way i try to put my thought my language is going to destroy it so yes postmodernist hermeneut analytical philosopher her hermeneuticians and deconstructionists they would not agree with krishna murti here that there is an experience which is not unarticulable but yes that is the lived experience of uh, people and, and these are the transformatory experiences. And uh, I would probably pause here uh, by saying that it's not unconditional positive regard that is at the center of counseling and teaching. It's unconditional compassion and love. 
and and that is uh, how uh, probably krishna murti help us elevate our own engagements with others thank you thank thank you because that was really wonderful i um i i really like the idea when you talked about you know like especially in the west there is so much emphasis on techniques strategies and india just follows everything that happens in the west right mainly uh, most of the people do that i have seen that uh, but like this obsession with now the obsession with outcomes is growing right outcomes techniques strategies measurement and the techniques of measurement but like very few people talk about the being of the teacher if you read i think you will enjoy reading ted aoki if you haven't read him it's he's a japanese uh, in a japanese canadian scholar who is like really revered in canada and north america uh, he talks about the the significance of being right so we want teachers to be facilitator technicians implementers of the curriculum but we never care about the being of the teacher if the being is a good being if i can use the word or a compassionate being as you were saying or a being that loves then what will happen in the classroom will be very different students will still learn history geography these are artificial divisions anyways these disciplinary divisions knowledge is not divided or fragmented like that but they will still learn all that but perhaps they will learn something more valuable than just that and i think that was the whole focus of uh, the uh, uh, that was the entire focus of uh, i think krishna murt is thinking that students should not just learn the subject matter that is very important but that, but that there should be learn there should be love there should be communication there should be dialogue uh, between the students and you know couple couple of things i want to say uh, you started your talk with the uh, the that the past is not important of course it is not important in one sense but krishna murthy himself asked people to write his biographies he would say please write my biography so i think a past as a self centered uh, occupation is perhaps not important but past as a way to learning what happened at least in one narrative or multiple narratives the the more i reflect back on the past the more things i discover right so i think as a as a journey as as a journey of learning and discovery i think past is very important and one more thing i want to say before i give it to neha you know uh, when i wrote about krishna murti Uh, you must have felt that i'm trying to formulate right and other persons may have uh, felt that but i have been reading krishna murti and engaging with krishna murti so intensely within myself and with everybody when i got, got uh, 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 the permission to write phd on krishna murti i rest i wrote incessantly without break and it was so quick for me to write my entire thesis because i wasn't formulating maybe it f- feels when you read it okay he has structure but i just poured and poured and poured and then it got uh, uh, into the structure of the thesis so thank you vikas mm-hmm. neer do you have thoughts for vikas and then uh, it, if it is open for chat then that great that's great yeah i have so many chats um, uh, so many comments but i have i have opened up the chat just so that people know so you can start to populate the chat with um the questions um hopefully it's open and you can select everyone uh, so that your message goes to everyone we can all see it but one while- be- mm-hmm. okay, can i just say before everybody starts chatting you know last time when when we were having the discussion there was a comment that gandhi was uh, very violent and then other people started responding to that i would really encourage everybody to keep a uh, respectful and thoughtful tone you may have certain things against some people like i mentioned the name osho a lot of there are a lot of people in the world who hate him uh, you you are you are welcome to hate him hate him to the, the to the best of your capacity but this is space let's please make it a positive space not a negative ask critical questions you ask as many critical questions as you would like but uh, let's make sure that this is not a negative space so that people begin to feel uncomfortable or unhappy neha go ahead yeah that's good advice so, so far we have had a really positive experience with the chat so keep the questions coming um yeah. so just while people are kind of formulating their questions and getting them in there i thought um well i i have a whole page of stuff that i i wrote down when you were talking because uh, so much of it resonated with me but there were a couple things in particular i i i really liked how you um you know kind of consciously placed krishnamurthy outside of 
you know, pure postmodernism, which has a little bit of a, in my view, at least a crippling sense of commitment to plural to pluralism, you know. Um, so I, I did appreciate that just, just uh, for the academics who are aware of some of those terms. Um, but I one thing that I also really loved with, that you were talking about was um, the difference in experience that you had between reading Krishnamurti versus listening to him, because I have definitely had I, I definitely shared that experience. Um, when I, I read him, I, I read him as I would like a text. But when I was listening to him, there was often times when I'm like following everything precisely. But then if somebody said to me, hey, so what did he say? Like, why did you enjoy that talk so much? I'd be like, I don't have no, I have no idea what he said. I don't know. You know, so, so something, there was something qualitatively different about the, the listening aspect. Um, and, and I enjoyed that you linked that then to dialogue, which is, I hadn't made that link myself, but linking the, the silences and the spaces in, in the listening aspect to the silences in dialogue was, I think, an insightful connection. So thank you. Well, thank somebody's you. asking, Laurie Cook is asking, wondering how all this fits with transformative learning and how uh, it fits with uh, mental illness. Well, I think this is, uh, this is very transformative learning, but go ahead, Vikas, and then I can respond to it. Well, uh, yeah, I think I uh, missed uh, talking about philosophical counseling first. Um, so uh, this, this idea of uh, uh, philosophical counseling is, is a result of a, a strong move, shift away from traditional idea of therapy and uh, mental health. So uh, it, we, we all know that, uh, that the, the, the shift away from DSM happened with existentialism, it happened with psychoanalysis, and then uh, even Carl Rogers in a way shifted away from standardization of disorders. But uh, very few people know that there is a strong movement, there was a strong movement against psychiatry. And R.D. Lang and others were, were at the pinnacle of it when they were writing about anti-psychiatry. That how this whole idea, how this whole notion that mental health can be maintained through medicines uh, was was uh, uh, being questioned. So people who worked on anti psychiatry, they then uh, started working in in a sort of uh, in, uh, and these were clinicians, and they started working as more more in, in a self subversive way that they were subverting their own profession, which was counseling. And uh, philosophical counseling is again a shift from there. So there is this. Uh, uh, a group of uh, philosophers, counselors who have come together in different spaces uh, and uh, they, uh, they, their position, they, they are, it's very, there are differences there, but the central argument is that most questions of our lives are uh, philosophical questions. So yes, they, they do agree that there could be certain neurological uh, uh, um, disorders or so, some other disorders which are based in our genes or, or which are there by birth. But things like depression, anxiety, uh, all these things are being understood as a result of not uh, responding to our own life questions and life struggles. So in, in this way, I see Krishnamurti as a counselor who, who makes you uh, come face to face with, uh, PA, uh, with with anxieties, with depression, with and with other struggles, and then in a compassionate, loving way helps you uh, come out of it and heals you. Mm -hmm. So that is how I learned it. Uh, well, I I think uh, uh, mental illness can be looked at in two ways. Uh... There are other questions as well, so I'll quickly respond and maybe uh, look at others' uh, ideas. But it can be looked at in two ways in, in my understanding. One is that there is an actually injury to the brain. Uh, so that, that's a very different um, way of looking at mental illness and mental illness in the sense of uh, anxiety or depression, which is rooted in the thought, which is rooted in the activities of the self. So in that, I would say uh, the, this existential inquiry is really important because it, it helps you see deeply what's happening in the self and, and bring an order to it, as Krishnamurti would say it. 
So Jayan Tachari is asking, enjoyed all three very candid sessions today. Have any students commented as to how this giving them space has helped them in learning and in life? Uh, I, I have heard it from Neha, I know it, and we just heard it from uh, Vikas. I think students students are craving for approaches like this. And I have had many, many, many experience, and you will see in the sessions tomorrow, three of my students who have studied with me will be presenting and how they have been experimenting with Krishnamurti. And I think that's a common experience with, uh, with Neha and with... Uh, uh, Vikas as well. Students do really appreciate it, how it has helped them, uh, not only just academically, but in, 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 in their whole being. Any of you would like to respond to this? Uh, just to share, uh, uh, recently, uh, uh, there is this national journal, uh, Mary, Mary uh, a Journal of Education, in which we published uh, students' explorations of uh, bachelor, uh, BH students' exploration of dialogue uh, so many of them wrote uh, about dialogue to sort of a conceptual analysis that was training them into. Uh, but another scholar of mine, uh, uh, Emmett scholar, who was the peer mentor of these uh, uh, B.Ed. students, she wrote a reflective account on uh, how she uh, experienced this process of peer mentoring. And uh, she has written one such account in, in, in a journal. Yeah, others I have as feedback form, but haven't formulated them or published them. I, I would like to respond to this question by Paul that mm -hmm. uh, uh, how would you, how would Krishnamurti, uh, uh, or what would Krishnamurti say about online distance learning? Uh, so initially when we started uh, with online learning, I was also quite apprehensive about how uh, this dialogue or dialogical engagement would unfold uh, with students whom, whom, whom we do not see because most of the times uh, they keep their cameras off. I'm happy to share with you that uh, the, the responses that I have got from them uh, while, while, uh, while they appreciated my classes was that, sir, it's not in what you say uh, that uh, we, 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 we feel comfortable talking to you or we want to discuss things with you. It is uh, more about how you approach things. So, uh, and, and some of the things that they shared with me is that uh, you do not judge us. You yourself uh, want us to have multiple perspectives. So whichever perspective we have, uh, you do not judge us on that. Uh, and that you give us space to share. And uh, you do not let us feel that what we are saying is stupid and uh, you value it. And, uh, and there was this interesting uh, uh, comment by a student that the way you engage with things, uh, it, it, it doesn't feel that it is coming from uh, an authority, even though we know that you are an authority. So it's, so the sense of, of you know uh, being in the same boat probably this feeling that helps them mm -hmm. so online distance learning even i mean, I mean I, I, what i want to say is that it's dialogue is not in words or in media that we use it is in the uh, way we engage in that media yeah, I thought maybe I'll just add to, to that for on the question of the online education. Um, I found that with my online classes, I, I, I thought something that helped was just opening a discussion about the experience of online classes. Um, and the platforms that we have are, as you can see from this conference, they're, they're as close as it kind of gets to feeling like you're with someone in a room. Um, but opening up the conversations with the students about how they're experiencing online learning really helped in and of itself because it gave them a space to express that they hated it um, at times, you know, and it's, I think that just again, like going back to our theme of the day of giving space, um, I think that allowing the expression, allowing people to say, I hate this format of, of learning, I would much rather be with you in person, 
was itself transformative for the experience itself. You know, they feel like some, some, somebody has heard you and, you know, and that's important. And just on the previous question of, of how has it transformed, how have students suggested that this change um, has affected them? I, I would say that giving people space, people have commented that giving them the space has enabled them to come into closer contact with themselves. But sometimes the change and the transformation is subtle. Like it's not that we see somebody was one way when they entered the classroom and was a totally different person on the other side. Sometimes that happens. You know, there are very shy people who are sometimes able to articulate, but um, sometimes it's subtle. And sometimes it's just a person feels like I have a little bit more awareness, a little bit more interest in knowing what's going on with me and what's, um, what's underneath the decisions that I make. So, and I really appreciate those subtle, subtle changes. I, I think what, and, actually, so go ahead Vikas. I think what happens is, is that, uh, that it o opens a door of inquiry for them that they begin to uh, value what it means to have a conversation, dialogue, what it means to uh, think freely, uh, what it means to bring your creative side out, what it means to express freely without being afraid. So I think th those are the things which are not uh, like hard measurable outcomes. Those are very subtle outcomes. And, and I also want to quickly say about the distance learning. See, my courses have been going very well. I, I experiment with the meditative inquiry in my, in my class uh, in teaching. But one thing that I would definitely say, I had a conversation with a student of mine yesterday in the house. Uh, I invited her, we, we were working on a project and that experience uh, can never be compared to online. So we are together, we are experiencing, but there is, uh, I personally feel that there is something in our beings uh, which, which uh, can only to some extent uh, be conveyed through online. So you will understand everything and probably you will see everything, but the, there are energies in our beings. And when we are together, those, I don't think those energies can be felt uh, online. Uh, and, and in a way, uh, this is the exact point where Krishnamurti would push us to, uh, to overcome this boundary of personal and professional, of, uh, you know, uh, of individual and social, of being of men and being a man or a woman. So, so all these boundaries that we create and that we focus upon, uh, these boundaries are probably... Uh, uh, the, the, the implicit uh, foundations that we have. They are in our minds and that is how they, they then express themselves in our, in, in our way of being. Uh, there is someone asking, Sabena Singh is asking a question. I think it's important. Uh, it's about uh, how to facilitate anti-racist training without being prescriptive? Yeah, I, I think that, that's a very, uh, very important question. Would anybody like to respond? I am happy to do so, but others can just jump in. Uh, so uh, just to share, uh, I teach a course on conceptual foundations of education to B.A. students. And, and these students, they do, not, they do not have any background in education. They come from different disciplines. Education as a discipline, I mean. They, they come from different disciplines. And uh, when they come to my classes, they are initially lost. And when and I tell them that I know that you will be lost for about a month. Uh, and the first thing that I uh, try to uh, get across to my students is that uh, there must be coherence in what you say. So so I, 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 uh, the activity that, that I do with them is I discuss different metaphors of teaching, ab about teaching and teachers. So they, they, they see teacher as a potter, as a gardener. So whatever c comes to them, to their mind. And then I push them to extend that metaphor to the role of the student, role of the parents, role of the institution, et cetera, et cetera. And the learning outcomes or aims of education, uh, the pedagogy. So in a way they realize that even when they refer to a particular metaphor in a small way, it has a lot of implications or uh, and in some, at, at some times a lot of baggage. So 
this sort of self awareness about what am i saying and what are its implications uh, this uh, uh, development of this sense is my central focus so then we move to teaching training indoctrination propaganda brainwashing so slowly and gradually uh, uh, through uh, a comparison contrast and finding examples of these uh, we arrive at I, the idea of conflict violence and uh, uh, plurality diversity inclusion so the uh, what i mean is that it is not just you know facilitating anti racist training or you know pro uh, uh, humanistic training or secular training it's not about training uh, if, if i were to say in, in in a more academic terms it's about teaching and 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 educating people about it so yes education is initiation as probably peters and hurst would put it but it is more than just initiation into certain rational practices it is about finding your own sense of being so one activity that i do is i make my students take positions about different issues and they are free to change their positions so it gives i try to give them this dual message that you should have a position as a teacher you should have a political stance as a teacher but yes that political stance should not be one which you hold uh, in in a orthodox way so i think again it's not just about telling them one or the other it's about developing this sense of good rather than uh, telling them what is good so sabina my quick response to that would be that once you are uh, uh, you are saying how basically you are asking how the inner transformation can be implemented Uh, i would say we really need not worry about that i know that the the thing is that uh, see the way i started teaching or what i did in my dissertation it's like a continuous inner understanding is becoming taking expression outwardly so if you are uh, moved by issues of racism and discrimination and disparity uh, they will reflect in your uh, teaching or the, the training that you want to give uh, but Uh, when we try to prescribe when we try to give too much structures it 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 can it can become very limiting and we may start imposing our own ideological frameworks on things uh, rather than letting people discover as vikas was just saying neha you have any thoughts on this yeah i did want to just say something because so in i i was thinking about as you guys were talking and for me there's kind of two um levels of of you know anti-racism discussion at least within the law school where I can speak to so one is at kind of a structural level so we're trying to talk to students about how racism is embedded into our legal st- structures um and in that context i think it is prescriptive in in the sense that i i can comfortably say that when we have racism embedded into our structures that is a problem like that is bad i have judged it and you should probably judge it as bad too like that's prescriptive um and so i i give you an example like we have systems where you know you have to give evidence through written documentation right in the courts but sometimes when we have um indigenous litigation or or litigation involving aboriginal rights because their their historical traditions are oral they often don't have the written documentation and our structures aren't our system isn't structured to accommodate that right and so that can that's an example of um where our structures are kind of co- colonial and they don't necessarily mesh well with the, with other cultures right so i so we, we can talk about the, how racism is within our structures but then there's the internal part of understanding racism and and i think for me like in one of my classes at least we talk about um recognizing our own prejudices all of us together you know we talk about recognizing um the the assumptions that we make about one another whether it's women or uh, indigenous people or different races whatever it is and and so i think that's an a, a, a important part of the of the conversation looking inwards to see one's own prejudices no matter what your ethnicity so there are a uh, uh, quite a few questions but i will just go to the i think one question that is very important so vikas somebody is asking for your 
uh, material on dialogue. So I think I have it. You sent it to me. So I will send it to, to everybody. But this is a question by Gopal Krishna Murthy, and I think probably we can just respond to it, and probably we can end the session today. It says, "Thank you for sharing your journeys. Could you please share some more on the following? When listening to or reading Krishna Murthy, what might that process involve, or what might it demand of the reader, scholar, listener, interlocutor? To put it another way, what is one listening to for, or is this a wrong question?" Uh, it's a very interesting one. Uh, so when uh, so I I have got about ten copies of reflections on the self, uh, and whenever I feel uh, that someone needs it, I just slip a copy and I just give them a copy and have a look at it. So then they uh, ask the same question: What what am I looking at? And then I tell I, I tell that person nothing. Just just Look at the table of contents. Open up whichever page you feel like, and uh, I don't know what your questions are, but probably you will find some answers. You may find some answers in it. So it is with this tentative tone I uh, give a copy of uh, this collection by Raymond Martin on Krishna Murthy Reflections on the Self to anyone. So I would say the same. Uh, uh, it, it's not a wrong question. but it's your question to answer it's not uh, for us to answer so just open up any book uh, look for any keyword on krishna murthy website have a look at it you may like it may not like it if you like it then try listening to his videos on youtube i think all of his videos are available on youtube so, so that's a uh, sorry i just wanted to say vikas that th those are very good advice for Uh, i should have given gopal's background actually uh, so those are those are the questions for uh, uh, th those are probably the helpful comments uh, for uh, people who are not aware of krishna murthy gopal Chris, gopal actually studied in one of the krishna murthy school when he was young and he has been teaching probably in all of krishna murthy school so he is pretty pretty familiar <laughs> with krishna uh, krishna murthy so gopal <laughs> my response to that would be how should one it and uh, what would be the process i can tell you how i read it i cannot say what it might be for others uh, i read it with my whole being uh, or it it was something the most important thing when i was reading to him or i was listening to him it was not a time pass it was not to uh, uh, to have an answer to any question it was something that my being was craving and i engaged with him with my whole being whether it was listening or reading and what that did to me was uh, uh i would say just the in the reading and listening with your whole being the, the, you begin to see things and understand things differently i'm sure must have happened in, in a similar way with you or or with others and then uh, krishna murti is no longer important you have a respect for him you appreciate him but the, the 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 significance to a person drop so if i i would say if anybody ask okay how did i did it i did it this way but i think everybody has to find their own way but with anything in life or this this has been my experience so far in life with whatever you engage with your whole being you create a completely different uh, relationship with that thing it's it's no more a dualistic relationship that it's outside of you or it is different from you it just becomes part of your bone and marrow not in the sense of being conditioned by it a lot of people have been conditioned by krishna murti they speak like krishna murti they repeat krishna murti's phrases shamelessly uh, without understanding that uh, unless you are saying something that is authentically has changed your heart uh those words only create more mediocrity and corruption in the world A anything you want to say to that question here no i i think you captured it okay well i think uh, everybody this has been a great session so uh, uh last words maybe bikas would you like to say before we are closing this session yeah i would i would like to respond to colleen's uh, question uh and how would you suggest breaking down these interdisciplinary silos uh, it has been easy for me probably uh, because i was <coughs> in an education department and uh, there are already uh, 
within educational theory different disciplines incorporated uh, but one thing that i uh, ask all my scholars to do is find their own pain so whether they come to me for their project or for their dissertation or for their mphil or phd work uh, when when they bring uh, an idea to me i ask them how long can you think about this question and if their answer is not 24/7 then i ask them to write their own pain for themselves and i tell them that if it is too painful for you to write find some find something else or find a small part of it but uh, my attempt is to bridge this personal and uh, academic divide so uh, i asked so so people find uh, and come up with questions like homeschooling happiness uh, and uh, 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 feminist spirituality uh, these are three dissertations that i have uh, supervised in the past uh, 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 three years and then uh, uh, one of my scholars is working on wonder sense of wonderment uh, and he's in philosophy department and uh, another one is now thinking about something about about childhood developmentalism but she has not yet arrived at probably her pain so i am I'm, i'm still pushing her to write more and think more about it so yeah we can only facilitate that those reflections and you know arrival at ideas which are uh, central to our existence once you once a scholar arrives at that idea i think interdisciplinarity automatically comes that's my experience because the fact is that the knowledge and inquiry uh, we have created the discipline it's actually always interdisciplinary knowledge is not fragmented neha anything before we close no oh, i just i guess i will thank everybody again for coming and and vikas uh, for sharing your thoughts with us on this panel that was very very fun to be part of this panel with you um so for everybody who is tuning in you know how to get here same link as always and we'll see you at the same time same place uh tomorrow yeah thank you neha thank you vikas and thank you everyone for uh, joining the session today and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow tomorrow we will have presentations from uh, six teachers three from india and three from canada nova scotia so uh, we look forward to uh, having you uh, uh, join us tomorrow thank you thank you everyone